dear head of unit Karamali, dear rectors and vice president, dear speakers, distinguished participants. It is my pleasure to present the first annual open forum of the TORCH project, the research and innovation endeavor of CHARM European University titled Sustainability in a Post-Pandemic World, asking the right questions on the role of universities in research and innovation today. My name is Aniko Magyari. I'm the former Vice Rector of Scientific Affairs at ELTE, and it is my pleasure to be your host at today's event. Please be reminded that the session of the day are going to be recorded. It is our pleasure to open this event with a video message of Professor László Palkovic, Minister of Innovation and Technology of Hungary. The ladies and gentlemen, the colleagues, it is a great pleasure to welcome you at the first annual open forum of the TORCH project, focusing on the research, development and innovation dimension of the Charm EU Alliance. The Charm EU is one of the 41 European University Alliances and also one of the 11 alliances with Hungarian participation. The recent expansion of the alliance with three further partners is also a proof of the strength and viability of this alliance and enriches it uh, not only in terms of uh, geographic diversity but also in scope uh, by including the University of Applied Sciences in its community. We all agree that European higher education institutions play a major role in the research and innovation. However, in order to be able to address global changes and find adequate solutions to key challenges, they need to form partnership and cooperate, co cooperate with each other, uh, with industry and also with other stakeholders. The European Universities Programme is a highly forward-looking initiative that, in addition to education, also supports the research and innovation mission of higher education and, more broadly, strengthens Europe's research excellence and competitiveness through strategic cooperation between institutions and university alliances. In the 21-27 programming period, synergies between the various programmes, including Erasmus Plus and Horizon Europe, is emphasised more than ever. Closer than ever, collaborations between the universities forming the alliance, in addition to direct research cooperation, provide the basis for joint action to exploit and potential of the Horizon Europe Framework Programme. European University alliances bring uh, to life innovative and uh, the diverse solutions that can be globally attractive in their novelty. We are proud how, uh, how to, we are proud to the strong Hungarian representation in the European Universities Network. The Ministry for Innovation and Technology, responsible for higher education and also for research and innovation, is strongly committed to support them. This support is also clearly visible at the policy level. Many of the objectives of Hungary's National Research, Development and Innovation Strategy for 2021 to 2030 are in line with those of the European University Programme. Knowledge creation, knowledge transfer and knowledge valorization are equally important pillars in a knowledge-based society and are the three building blocks of the new research, development and innovation strategy of Hungary for the years of 21 and 23. In line with the national RDI strategy of number of cooperation initiatives has been launched in recent years. For example, higher education, industry cooperation centers, competence and centers, university ecosystems. The government is giving an increasing role to university centers in strengthening quadruple helix networks and the local innovation ecosystem. The university ecosystem program launched in 2019 follows similar objectives by strengthening innovation capacities in higher education and supporting the establishment and effective cooperation of a result-oriented innovation ecosystem at domestic universities. Under the heading of knowledge valorization, the support of innovation ecosystem is also a clear priority. In Hungary, we have launched the Cooperative Doctoral Program, which has been developed in the spirit of supporting the cooperation between industry and academia and allowing researchers to gain experience on industrial needs and working environment. Stimulation of knowledge and technology transfer with the innovation ecosystem, the promotion of open innovation and open access, promoting research careers uh, that ensure mobility between academic and business sector and also international mobility and, in more general, promoting international research development innovation cooperation are just a few of our objectives. Strengthening the social embeddedness of higher education training and research in Hungary is also a priority, as increasing the economic and social role of higher education institutions is of key importance in order to successfully address future challenges. 
Regarding open science, I'm pleased to share with you that the first national position paper on open science was launched in October 2021 in response to the current paradigm shift in the world of science. The statement aims uh, to draw the attention of the scientific community in Hungary towards the importance and timelines of the new approach, its strategic issues, and the increasingly important role of open, uh, open science in international cooperation. The signatories of uh, the declaration support the promotion of open science practices and call on all stakeholders in the scientific community to join and sign up to this resolution. Apart uh, from uh, that, other measures, such as uh, the mainstreaming of open science in national calls, uh, are planned to encourage more stakeholders to join the open science approach. As for the renewal of the research assessment system, we agree uh, with uh, the need for improvement, but we believe that it certainly needs a critical mass. In order to change the culture of evaluation, to move from publication and citation-based world into a broader impact-based assessment system, we need to combine our efforts and embark, embark on this uh, uh, dramatic transformation process together. Ladies and gentlemen, let me finally wish you a fruitful virtual meeting. Thank you for your attention. So I would like to give the floor to Professor Laszlo Borhi, Rector of Ötvös Lorend University, to greet the participants at the host of the event. Dear Head of Unit uh, Karamelli, dear Minister Palkovic, Presidents, Vice Presidents, representatives of extra academic stakeholders of European University alliances, students, researchers. It's a great honor to welcome you today to the first TORCH annual open forum of the CHARM European University Alliance. Ötvös Lorand University is the oldest continuously operating higher education institution in Hungary, established in 1635, has been fulfilling a pioneering role on many fields of scholarship in our country. We are very proud that as a member of CHARM EU, we can contribute with its results, not only to Hungarian higher education, but also to the developments in the Hungarian research and innovation landscape with the support of the Horizon program. Of course, we wished to host the first joint event of the, the TORCH project here in the historic Aula Magna, the ceremony hall of our university. Most unfortunately, this turned out to be still impossible due to the pandemic. However, we are proud to greet you in the virtual space that, although not in the same way, still enables us to connect in these most difficult times. And here, I refer not only to the pandemic. I'm very sad to say that while ELTE hosts the first TORCH annual open forum, Ukraine, one of our neighboring countries, is at war. Occasions like this forum are usually called celebrations of scholarship, but now is not the time for celebration. It is, however, a time when building the strongest network possible, sharing all the knowledge that can be shared, and utilizing scholarship to solve our common global problems has become more urgent than ever before. In, this, in the years since the founding of the CHARM EU Alliance, its members have embarked on the unprecedented journey towards a new dimension of multilateral cooperation. At Ötvös Lorand University, the rapidly growing number of staff and external stakeholders involved in our activities ensures, on the one hand, that the joint strengths of the Alliance become our own. On the other hand, that we successfully utilize these strengths to foster innovation in our local systems. The same is certainly true for all other members of CHARM EU. The internal st transformation catalyzed by the educational project of CHARM EU becomes complete through the TORCH project. This cooperation is centered around the university's mission of research and innovation involving the full range of diverse extra-academic stakeholders. 
beyond thinking about joint principles towards research and innovation, formulating a shared vision and setting relevant goals, the project teaches us to ask the proper questions about how to assess research and researchers more fairly and effectively, how to foster innovation, how to be as open as possible in our scholars, uh, scholarly endeavors. Utrecht Lorand University shares the dedication of the Alliance to make open science one of the main paradigms of research. We are determined to improve our standards in all dimensions of open science, and we are convinced that its values such as openness, transparency, and stronger links between science and the general public are fundamental goals for all of us. Still, we do not forget that open science cannot be a final objective. It will always remain an evolving process. In the same way, we firmly believe that the TORCH project uh, contributes significantly to comprehensive evaluation, strategic planning, and targeted actions concerning our research assessment system, in accordance with the priorities of the European Research Area Policy Agenda. Today's forum brings together key stakeholders to discuss related uh, questions. Another key topic for today will be the role of universities in engaging all stakeholders in a quadruple helix. At Utrecht Lorand University, we believe that the role of universities has become especially important in the public domain. Our task is to provide our students and extra academic partners with a general awareness of scholarship. On the one hand, this entails a broad spectrum of citizen science activities carried out by universities, tackling societal, societal needs and challenges. This can only be handled effectively in continuous dialogue and cooperation with social stakeholders, mainstreaming inclusion, diversity and equality, social responsibility. On the other hand, the transdisciplinary dialogue fostered by universities means a close cooperation with industrial partners in order to become able to address economic needs, contributing to environmental sustainability, digital transformation, emerging technologies and economic comp competitiveness. These goals can only be reached by continuous communication within our universities between those responsible for education, research, and the third mission activities of the institutions. In the framework of TORCH, we raise the question, how we can do this in the right way? We work hard to draw lessons, not only from the, our success stories, but also from our failures. The challenges and barriers we have to face when engaging with the public and with industry. For, as for Utrecht Lorand University, the TORCH project provided a never-before-seen opportunity to do self-assessment in all these OBA fields, drawing conclusions on how to move forward for the benefit not only of the institution, institution itself, but of the society it wishes to serve. I'm convinced that the same is true for our partner institutions. We are glad that uh, at this occasion we can share the results of the first year of our project and provide a platform for discussions amongst alliances and with extra-academic stakeholders in key part as key partners. I do hope that this day will bring valuable and useful experience for all participants, laying the foundations of joint thinking and contributing to the co-creation of a European research area in accordance with the joint European values and common goals. Thank you for your kind attention. No, thank you. Uh, no, I would like to ask Professor Jordi Garcia, Vice Rector for Research of the University of Barcelona, to give his welcoming speech. I can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Magali. Uh, good morning, everybody. Their authorities, uh, and the rector, the vice rector, their academics, professionals, students, um, representative of several uh, social parts, 
stakeholders and public in general. Thank you very much for staying here in the first annual forum of this torch that unfortunately is online. We expect that the next one will be um, in person because one of the things that uh, I think we, we really wish is to improve the interaction between uh, members of the torch project and of the society in general. And this interaction when it's in person is much more fruitful than online. But still, we are in these conditions. I'm very proud to, to be the PI of the TORCH project, as we heard from the rector of the LT University. Uh, this is a new adventure that I think is special. It's special for two reasons. First, because it's the first that our universities are enrolled in this field, the field of research at the international level, at the a European level, and also because, because it is a derivative of the CHARM project. Of all of you know, the CHARM project is uh, the first uh, European university alliance that has started a European multicentric master studies that with high success. Uh, we will enter in the second year in September, I think. But of course, starting this torch, transforming open research through CHARM, is a great opportunity to see how we can, at the European level, coordinate the force of research. Because as uh, we all are aware, science is absolutely interdisciplinary, is absolutely international, and there is no reason that each university, each research center, work on its own without a coordination with all the universities, most universities, but also uh, to increase the coordination through society stakeholders. We work for society, so this is why several of the most important objectives of the torch is to increase the public engagement in science, to promote open science, uh, and also to promote research through uh, the UNESCO, the ONU objectives of um, sustainability. Uh, we are killing the planet as, a, as a humans, and we, as a scientists, have to try to help in not doing so. Uh, this, I think, then that the, uh, our project, the TORS project, will help a bit on that. Uh, we are pioneers. Uh, so we are very excited of doing that, and I will really, really would like to say a big, big, big thank you to the myriad of scientists and professionals who have been collaborating with the, with the torch with a lot of difficulties, especially because of the pandemics. But still, I think that uh, we are a great team that uh, will go far away in our objectives. So thank you very much and. Welcome to this first open open day, I would say, open day of the Torch meeting. Thank you very much, Jordi Garcia, uh, Garcia. And now I would like to ask Dr. Nicole Birkel, Fit40 Managing Coordinator, to convey the message of Professor Stefan Müller-Stach, Vice President for Research at GGU, Mainz Fit40 Coordinator. Okay. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, you probably expect now a short welcome note from the Vice President for Research and Early Career Academics of Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, who is the coordinator of the Fit for Them project of the For Them Alliance, Professor Dr. Stefan Müller-Stach. Unfortunately, Stefan cannot be with us here today due to urgent official affairs. He has therefore asked me to speak on his behalf and read out his greetings. My name is Nicole Birkle, and I am the managing coordinator of the project, so I represent Stefan at the working level of the day-to-day -day project work. Dear colleagues from the European University Networks, dear organizers from CHARM EU, and dear speakers and participants of the today's event. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the two days event for their great work and their efforts to make this Torch Forum a reality. 
Today's meeting is going to be the foundation of our first joint deliverables of the SWAS projects. I'm honored and pleased to be part of this and also to have the opportunity to address some saluting words to all of you. Even if this is an online event and many of us are relatively tired of virtual meetings, nevertheless, this is an extraordinary occasion. The TORCH Annual Forum is the first joint event of the pilot group of alliances involving in the SWAFs projects. And I'm also very pleased that fit for them could at least a bit contribute to this event, both as co-organizers and also by sharing our project progress in the sessions. We are all more or less working on the same topics in our projects and therefore it's quite expectable that we pool our expertise and ideas together to maximize the impact of our alliances. After all, one of the assumptions behind the establishment of the European universities is that we become that we come to commonly accepted solutions for the future of research and innovation and that we do it not only for the participating universities, but also in general for Europe's research community. The importance of exactly these forms of joint capacity building on the one hand and the willingness of researchers to deliver and openly share outstanding results under the great pressure that has, has never become more evident than in the last two years of the pandemic. And you can imagine how proud we are in minds that the two founders of BioNTech, the firm behind the Pfizer vaccine, are researchers based at our University Medical Center. But that's just a small side note on my own behalf, which I ask you to excuse. What became also very important during this time of the pandemic was that we need to rethink traditional forms of cooperation and sometimes we need to overcome old habits and work towards a more digitized and open collaboration. Because of the pressing nature of the situation, Open Science has been giving an important additional dimension on top of all the other demand demanding components of research and innovation. We hope to hear more about that later today. The For Them Alliance is composed of public universities from Spain, Italy, France, Germany, Poland, Latvia and Finland and is soon to be joined by two universities from Norway and Romania. As it is probably the case with most of the alliances, these institutions represent various organizational structures in research and innovation, prioritize different academic areas and have developed peculiar working relationships with their regional partners. Yet, we are discovering every day that there is more that unites us than divides us and that we can constantly learn from each other about how research supports are organized how human capital is attracted, how partnership with business is established, and how transformations initiated by European and national policymakers are facilitated. We are eager to share our preliminary work and learn from other alliances how to devise plans for the implementation of transversal issues. In this conference, we look forward to exploring various pathways to responsible research practices inter- and transdisciplinarity, inclusiveness and diversity in academia, as well as best practices for making research enhance quality education and improve social relations. Last but not least, we are impressing our solidarity with the people of the Ukraine and appeal to the world and European leaders to bring peace and save lives. Otherwise, how can researchers and academics be asked to design and work for the sustainability of an unsafe continent. Thank you very much. Let's turn our attention to our main topic. We will start our discussion by, discussions by an overview of research and innovation trends in a post-pandemic and pandemic world. Our distinguished speakers will provide us with an insight into current trends and strategic thinking of this topic. Based on this overview, our event addresses the question how we can advance this agenda and what can be, what can be the role of the U European University Alliances and their science, weed and for society projects in this regard. Uh, first of all, it is my honor to give the word 
to Ms. Apostolia Karamali, head of the Academic Research and Innovation and Research Organizations Unit at the Directorate General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission. She has a background in earth sciences and remote sensing, and she has worked in the area of space and research policies and associated programs. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be with you here today, and thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I have shared the presentation just a few minutes ago. I don't know if, if somebody could project it. Otherwise, I can speak freely and apologize uh, for this uh, inconvenience. Um, so, um, first of all, I would like to uh, excuse Jeanne-Éric Paquet, who, due to prior commitments, my Director General could not join you today. But he sends his uh, warm regards and uh, he's particularly sensitive to all the uh, statements that we heard about the ongoing crisis. Uh, in my presentation today, or in my participation in this, um, uh, in this panel, I would like to update you with the most recent policy developments from the research innovation side. But before I do that, let me tell you how pleased I am to see these uh, projects supported under Horizon 2020 taking scale and uh, being able to participate in such a rich discussion such as uh, today. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic to be able to to be with you uh, to be with you today. So. Um, I, I would like to update you on three main elements when it comes to the research innovation dimension. First, the European strategy for universities. Secondly, where we stand with the European research area. And then I would like to say a few words about the innovation policy as there is an ongoing, um, ongoing work. And I would finish by uh, informing you about the Horizon Europe part. Um, so, first of all, um, as you know, the Commission published, uh, uh, adopted its, uh, Euro the European Strategy for Universities on 18th of January. This triggered a, a policy discussion at the Informal Competitiveness Council with ministers from higher education and research organized by the French presidency the week after in January, and also a back-to-back -back, uh, a Europe university forum, uh, which was quite impressive as it brought together um, many speakers, workshops addressing a multitude of elements. Um, therefore, this strategy is now the backbone uh, on, uh, let's say, from a policy perspective um, with regard to um, a policy support to the university sector. The strategy took a holistic approach to education, research, innovation, service to society. And of course, uh, um, it takes into account the autonomy of the institutions and, uh, and takes, a, let's say, an approach so as to see how we can uh, support uh, universities and how the universities can be empowered through this strategy to perform your role. Uh, this strategy has uh, four strategic objectives. First of all, strengthening the European dimension in higher education and research, uh, how to underpin transnational cooperation, and as part of that, uh, how we can uh, underpin, uh, let's say, an investment pathway, the emergence of an investment pathway, which is more seamless with respect to what we have today. For this, also, the Commission adopted a, pr a proposal for a Council recommendation, and both the strategy and the, the recommendation, of course, are currently under discussion at the Council for the preparation of Council conclusions, so therefore the political orientations of the Council and the adoption of the Council recommendation, and the plan is to do this by April. The second objective is to uh, consolidate universities as lighthouses of our European way of life. So uh, this is about strengthening the quality and relevance for future proof skills, fostering diversity, inclusiveness, gender equality, promoting and protecting European democratic values, a very important element in the current uh, uh, situation that we face in Europe. Third objective, uh, empowering universities as key actors of change in the twin and green and digital uh, transitions. This comes as no surprise. And finally, a fourth objective on reinforcing universities as drivers for the global role and leadership, and this is addressing the international dimension of the role of universities and reaching out to the world um, also as model uh, of cooperation and underpinning uh, many objectives, uh, let's say, from, from Europe. 
so this is where we stand today on the European strategy for universities. And then the next point I would like to update you is about uh, the European research area. Ministers uh, of research adopted an important package of Europe for the European research area in November last year, which included the toolkit in order to make the new European research area more practical um, bringing together the work of member states, stakeholders, and the European Union itself. Um, so this toolkit adopted is, consists of a pact for research and innovation, a new methodology for the era governance, and the era policy agenda. What are those and why they are important? First of all, we have been a long way, we have had a long way with the European research area, starting from uh, a broad, uh, let's say back in the year 2000, from the acceptance of the need up to having the European research area in the Treaty of the Union. And now we believe that we have come into putting in a council recommendation an outline of the elements that are shared and are, and are cherished at European level. And these are values and principles to begin with. Secondly, um, investment targets and efforts for research and innovation. Thirdly, areas of joint action. And finally, a monitoring mechanism. When it comes to the era governance, in addition to Commission and Council, um, we now have the ERA Forum that brings together the stakeholders. Universities are represented as are one of the groups of stakeholders that are represented in the ERA Forum, um, currently with one member and one alternate. And also, of course, universities are very much involved in, all, in many in numerous consultation meetings, uh, as you know very well, and with specific meetings also for European universities. And finally, the era policy agenda is some sort of work plan uh, which uh, outlines a number of actions to be implemented, which are feasible to implement in order to make concrete progress in the next two years, two to three years. And uh, um, we are now in a situation where we, the Commission has prepared a number of explanatory documents for this uh, era policy agenda actions, and we expect to have discussions um, or, uh, almost on the, every two weeks there are discussions on the different actions, and these are shadowed by operational consultation meetings uh, where universities uh, do participate uh, and provide their views. Um, just to uh, take one moment to bring your attention to some actions which are very relevant for this forum. This is not an exhaustive list, and these actions are cross-referenced also in the strategy for universities. Um, one, uh, one action is dedicated on people, so what we do for research careers. The ERA policy agenda foresees a mechanism for the reform of the research assessment, and I understand that you will be having discussions later on on this, foresees uh, action on gender, but it also foresees an action, on dedicated action on research careers. And here we take, uh, let's say, a, a, a two-strand um, two approach. The first strand is that we need a European, holistic European framework for research careers. The Portuguese presidency last year was extremely um, uh, engaged into preparing council conclusions about what this framework should include, from working conditions to employment conditions to um, career development, career progression, um, open and, and transparent uh, recruitment processes, um, the aspects linked to innovation and circulation of talent uh, within uh, uh, the EU, the aspects linked to skills, uh, and uh, uh, in particular the recognition of the profession and uh, the creation of uh, taxonomies, clear taxonomies for the researcher profession, the researcher levels, and so on, just to mention a few points that are addressed there. The other strand of action is about uh, creating a, a common toolbox between stakeholders and member states and, and the Commission about uh, good practices. And we have had extensive evidence gathering uh, on these good practices, and this evidence gathering comes also from projects such as TORCH, um, where we come up with good practices, and the, the intention now in the, in the next few months is to finalize specifications and launch a call for expression of interest in order to engage into uh, de developing a common uh, community of practice uh, with such, uh, let's say, best practices in order to spread opportunities across the EU. Another action I would like to draw your attention to is directed to institutions. I mentioned before people, now institutions. Institutions, of course, universities are concerned. 
uh, by the previous actions that I mentioned in the sense of uh, that they need to engage and embed into the university governance into uh, implementing such actions. But there is an action which is more linked to universities and this, we call these universities as institutions and we call it connected universities. <clears throat> and here we want to address First and foremost, the promotion of excellence uh, in Europe and especially projecting Europe as a leader globally and universities in global and, and international partnerships. And here we, we want to develop on the basis of national initiatives um, a European Excellence Initiative, um, which can it could in the future, for example, have a link to the ERC targeting institutions. And I think all the groundwork that is done now through the European Universities um, uh, research uh, projects can actually feed that uh, um, that process. Another dimension is linked to the digital. And finally, uh, and I'm conscious of the time, um, uh, another action where I would like to attract your attention is the action which is uh, um, targeting ecosystems and uh, the, de the development of era hubs promoting talent and innovation locally, place-based. Uh, so this is another dimension which is extremely important as universities are important actors of the ecosystems, important actors to promote growth, promote knowledge, promote talent. And therefore universities are already embedded in their local ecosystems and we want to take these best practices and expand them across Europe through uh, what is known as the ERA Hubs initiative. And by this initiative, we also envisage, for example, the promotion of more opportunities for incubators, accelerators, and more opportunities for technology transfer, knowledge transfer more broadly, uh, and uh, startups and even scale-ups uh, from universities. Um, the, the last point I wanted to update you on uh, is on the innovation policy. So last year, there were a series of consultation events and processes regarding a possible innovation initiative. There was discussion about European unicorn founders, uh, innovation ecosystems, the role of women in venture capital and innovation survey of the European innovation ecosystem, just to name a few. A VAC forum was launched. Many of you contributed to all these processes. And uh, we have recently had an internal political decision in the Commission to proceed with a communication on innovation, likely before summer. And this innovation uh, policy would address uh, aspects such as access to finance, focusing mostly on scale up finance, uh, uh, the framework conditions, including legislation, for example, how to promote more innovation procurement, how we can strengthen the innovation ecosystem, how we can attract talent, and also, for example, tackling the innovation divide. So this gives you an overview of the current interlinked trends which affect the university directly. And of course, this is not an exhaustive link, uh, list, as I said. Um, last point on programs, uh, you know that uh, there are uh, ongoing calls uh, through Erasmus, but at the same time there are, although in a smaller scale, uh, ongoing calls from Horizon Europe, in particular under the widening participation and strengthening uh, the European research area part, the cross-cutting part of Horizon, where we have actions to support the development of all these actions that I was saying before the activities under under ERA, and we also have a stronger, let's say, more more budget intensive action under the widening part to underpin brain circulation and also to uh, support excellent universities and uh, create capacity building towards uh, participation to future European university initiatives. So we hope that, to, and here I conclude, we hope that through all these initiatives and opportunities through funding programs, we can uh, support you in your role. And um, uh, despite the complexity of the, of the policy landscape, uh, and, uh, and thank you very much for this opportunity to outline them to you. I'm available for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Apostolia. Uh, I forgot to mention that, of course, after the end of each uh, talk, we have time for discussion. So if you have questions, please either raise your hand or uh, type the question into the chat window. Uh, just to start the discussion, I have a question to you, Apostolia. You talked about uh, researchers' careers uh, um, and uh, uh, 
some kind of uh, instruction tool, toolkit box uh, for universities. What do you think? What would be the most urgent task of European university alliances in this regard and, and how the uh, Commission thinks about the role of the university alliances uh, uh, in making all these changes in research and innovation? First of all, um, in your projects, um, you have already included uh, work packages addressing people, how you can promote uh, human resources uh, strategies more broadly. Many of you have also engaged into developing human resources strategies and having the excellence award, the European Excellence Award for Human Resources Strategies. So this is already a great added value. We expect uh, to see, uh, I said before that in the context of the deployment of ERA, there will be a lot about exchange of best practices, identification of good approaches and methodologies and spreading this across Europe. So therefore we see the role of European University Alliance as a very important role in order to create a model of practice for the broader European higher education sector uh, itself, but also as candidate uh, uh, alliances in the future to experiment even further, of course, uh, uh, as uh, with, with your uh, acceptance, um, certain new tools that will be developed uh, through these uh, new practices. So uh, providing, providing strategic recommendations, but also testing uh, certain elements. And one element that will come, I said before, it's a, this European framework for research careers with, uh, as a council recommendation, with uh, guidance about uh, career development, career progression, skilling, and so on. So um, we expect that this, uh, as a next step, we can see together with you um, what practical uh, elements could be taken up uh, uh, by your alliances. Just to be very concrete in my um, in my reaction, and this of course comes in addition to all the exchanges that we have, uh, or either bilaterally per alliance or through for for EU for EU two uh, with alliances more broadly. Thank you very much. Uh, I have one more question that regards uh, comes from an East Central European perspective, probably that the university alliances are probably a good floor to encourage the widening participation uh, uh, grant applications from uh, to form together with the uh, European University Alliance partners. Do you expect from these alliances to submit such applications or is it is it one role of these alliances in, in the Commission's, what is the Commission's view on it? Uh, I hope I understood your question cor correctly because there, were, there are there are some uh, sound uh, interferences at least on my end. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, as I said before, we are mobilizing the widening part of Horizon Europe to strengthen capacity uh, of universities established in widening countries, and we expect that this capacity will be strengthened by cooperation, uh, among other things, through cooperation with universities in non widening countries. In other words, we aim for cooperation rather than isolation. And therefore, we find it very relevant that there is this, uh, this link. At the same time, you know that we are bound by eligibility conditions. So the eligibility, the strict eligibility condition is that the coordinator needs to be established in a widening country. Other than that, there are no other strict call, uh, specific call conditions. But of course, there is a general expectation that we have to see benefits in entities established in widening countries, uh, including in the budget distribution. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Apostolia. I, I don't see more questions. Uh, so I welcome our next speaker uh, from Budapest. Uh, Chilla Stegner is here with us personally. She is the senior manager and leader of the education group at the government advisory of PVC Hungary. She has more than 15 years experience in higher education, institutional management and central government management. She holds a PhD in educational science. Chilla, please come here. Dear conference participants, uh, 
this is a great pleasure to be here today and to be able to speak to you. It's not only a pleasure, it's a great honor. And uh, I would really like to thank uh, the leadership of Tvishlant University for having invited an outsider, uh, a consultancy agency, P PwC, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers today. And I will share um, our insights and our global uh, knowledge base on what we think what are the, the, the challenge, challenges and what are the, the uh, insights to, to transform our higher education institutions. So I would bring mostly the institutional aspects today. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, my first slide is just about the world around us. Um, I don't really think we have to give too many comments to this. Um, our world is turbulent and the changes are completely unexpected. I think we can say this to, to COVID uh, crisis. This was quite unexpected in 19, uh, in 19 and 20. And uh, today's uh, events in Ukraine, we would not have thought about them uh, a month ago. And also there's, uh, there's uh, the global sustainability crisis or sustainability issues that this conference is willing to tackle or willing to, to think about. Um, these, these issues and challenges in the global world um, give us a lot of uh, food for thought and uh, propose a lot of challenges for research and innovation. Can we move on? As we would see today, these challenges that face us are usually global. They are very pressing. They affect the whole society, not only economics, so it's not only about being on top of uh, the economy, uh, having the highest growth, or uh, being uh, the cutting edge in, in, in an economic uh, setting. It's about society, and it's about staying alive. It's about keeping our world sustainable, and so it is high stakes, and we can't really solve these problems with the solutions that we already know. So we really, really have to boost uh, innovation and, uh, and research uh, within society. And since universities play uh, a key role in this, we really have to be able to transform and innovate our, our um, research and innovation in universities. Can we move on? Thank you. Uh, what do I mean? I will just be really, really short. I highlighted some issues. There could be a lot more to be raised, but I really think that we should consider having shorter research and innovation cycles. We really need answers quickly, so we would have to th see and think up uh, uh, methods, how to reach out and, and establish uh, uh, innovative teams or teams of research uh, with a wide range of participants very quickly. Uh, and shortening time for the research, that would be the new ways of, new ways of working, but also shortening the time for, for publishing the results. Um, I think all of us uh, have seen uh, with the vaccinations how important it was that we, we would get it fast and, and everyone uh, would, would uh, profit from it. Um, new ways of working, just some of the expect, um, aspects of, of this. Uh, there's no individual excellence anymore. Of course there is, but um, individuals are rarely the, the, able to solve complex global problems. We need groups and we need more group excellence and this has to be figured out how, how group excellence can be assessed, how group excellence can be measured and how groups uh, can form and reform uh, dynamically according to uh, diverse changes and, and fast uh, needs. Okay, uh, also collaboration and peer learning is a, a very uh, cool, a very uh, crucial um, aspect of this and uh, that needs to be a lot and lot of support for research and innovation groups in order for them to, um, to be able to perform at the highest uh, quality and, and give the best results that they can give. Also, there's an aspect about communication of results. Um, I can only speak for Central Eastern Europe, but I really think that there is still space and there is still um, development uh, space for us in academic writing competencies. And also, I don't think we emphasize enough uh, social communication of research results and, and non-academic type of uh, communication to the wider public. Can we move on, please? 
Um, okay, so in this context, uh, uh, PwC and Microsoft started collaborating last year in Hungary and uh, in CEE, and we came up with a framework and a vision for higher education institutional transformation um, that that is applicable for, for CEE, but might uh, be applicable elsewhere also. So based on our expertise, we provided a, a vision of how higher, agency, higher education institutions uh, could and probably should work. And also we came up with lots of uh, transformative project ideas, how to make it happen and what kind of uh, initiatives institutions can take in order to arrive to this vision. Thank you. Um, as you can see on, on this slide, um, there's, a, there's a Microsoft concept of uh, transforma educational transformation. This is the framework uh, with the four pillars of Microsoft. And in our collaboration, we figured out that actually in higher education, there should be five pillars. So we are uh, moving on to five. First of them is student success uh, and how to consciously shape the student journey in a higher education institution in order to provide the best quality uh, journey in terms of academic uh, learning and also in terms of experience of learning. Uh, the, second, uh, the second pillar is reimagining teaching and learning processes. This is about changing and re renewing methodology of teaching and learning in higher education. The third one is how to attract, retain and support excellent academic staff. Uh, the fourth one is about leading and fostering research and development and innovation. And the fifth one is how to become agile in operations and background operations uh, within higher education institutions. We have a vision for all these five pillars and also some transformative projects. But of course, since the topic today is research and innovation, I will, I will only focus on, on, uh, on this part. Can we move on, please? Thank you. Um, so we kind of mapped uh, the, the challenges, the common challenges uh, in CE in research. As uh, we could see, there's usually in higher education institutions a lack of focus. There's uh, uh, usually institutional research is based on the personal interest of academics and usually universities uh, have a hard time uh, steering the interest of academics and deciding on a strategical strand for, for, for targeting uh, the, the efforts and the resources within, uh, within uh, science or, or scientific research. Also, there's a low culture uh, or, or there's a culture with a lack of collaboration or little collaboration. There are still some silos that we are working uh, to break down here in CE. Also, um, there's uh, usually lack of uh, monitoring and evaluation with standards and, and, uh, and uh, uh, very clear criteria. Of course, there, there are lots of criteria, but these don't really represent, for example, collaboration and group work that we've mentioned that are, that are key issues. So, of course, there are lots of them, but they, they need to be um, revised. Um, there's less uh, leadership in Horizon projects and, and in big international research uh, uh, collaborations, usually from CE, which is a uh, uh, which is uh, something we have to develop in, and uh, often universities don't provide enough support, all kinds of support, to researchers. So researchers are, are, are challenged with uh, very, very multiple tasks. Um, also, we, as, as I mentioned before, there's a less intensive publication activity in CE. At the same time, there are real good uh, practices also. There are uh, centers of excellence, incubation uh, hubs, and, and uh, higher education and industry collaboration initiatives, like uh, the minister has uh, mentioned in, in many cases. Also, there's uh, the European Universities Research Network, and uh, also, as, as we've already established, there's this uh, cooperative doctoral program in Hungary that seems to be very uh, attractive and very uh, working really well. So these are some good existing uh, practices. And there are lots of opportunities that I will not go into in depth because of the, the development of technology and all the support that we can give to, uh, to researchers uh, in higher education institution. Thank you. So what can we do and what do we suggest with, uh, with Microsoft uh, for institutions to do? First of all, we suggest institutions to, to figure out the researcher's journey within an institution, to, to try to understand what is uh, 
the the researchers persona what are what types of personas there are um, as researchers what kind of a career roadmap exists what are the areas that need to be uh, supported that are not really there what are the constraints of researchers how how do they see their own uh, uh, see their own situation and and map a vision for for development thank you yeah, and I think what really is the first step is the PhD journey, and this is probably the most important slide that I have in this presentation. Usually when we think about the researcher's journey, we don't think about the PhD studies, though that is the first step. The experience a student has during PhD studies will decide if the student will become a researcher in real life or not. So many PhD students decide to just walk away from research and uh, choose other aspects of, of life and, and work somewhere else because the journey during PhD studies was not very, not very comfortable, not very challenging, or research itself didn't seem that very uh, appealing there. So I think this is one of the key issues. Uh, if you want to have the real excellence, we want to keep the real excellence there. We have to uh, make sure that the whole holistic uh, PhD journey is something very positive and very inspiring and leading uh, for, for uh, researchers to stay in research and want to continue this uh, as a career. Thank you. And then based on, based on the, 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 the study that you do for, for your research at Persona, we encourage institutions to develop a new end-to-end -end journey for researchers and uh, provide support at each step of the journey. Um, of course, it starts with the PhD students and then um, how you can do induction when they in, enter the institution, how to provide support for them and opportunities. Uh, how to how to provide onboarding, uh, p learning support, mentoring uh, during their careers, uh, how to provide administrative support and post research support in in disseminating results. Um, also, we encourage uh, higher education institutions. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we encourage higher education institutions to develop um, uh, research office and the research information system in order to be able to map and steer um, research activities within a higher education institution and also to, to be able to really support research from being able to identify an opportunity for, for, uh, for support for Horizon or whatever kind of uh, bid that, that the university can go for, uh, forming teams how to support writing a feasibility study, how to support the real execution of the research, all the IT that you need for collaboration, for data sharing, for, for uh, analysis on the data, uh, on, on uh, modern technological tools that exist with, uh, uh, that, that would support you. But also there could be health and safety issues, there could be ethical issues in uh, in uh, there and you would need to have a professional team in your university who would support all in from these all these aspects um, the researcher teams in order for the researcher teams to concentrate on research only and uh, and uh, arrive at the results real fast and uh, successfully and thank you for your attention i just wanted to share these thoughts with you Thank you very much, Sheila. Please stay okay. here. Don't go away. We have a very short time for questions. Yes, I know. I think because this is a Hungarian-related uh, uh, development, what you do, a governmental advisory yeah. role, I would like to ask you one or two questions. Um, I noticed that you talked about uh, um, research collaboration as a very important aspect. And I know uh, a little bit about the Hungarian situation that we are generally very weak yeah. in, in collaborative research. And here in Budapest, uh, uh, in scope of, uh, um, of the TORCH uh, uh, project and also within CharmU and other uh, initiatives, we already try to make steps how to improve collaborative research. What is your view, knowing the Hungarian situation, how could we transform this to be more collaborative within the Hungarian 
uh, research project? I think it's a cultural issue. Uh, it's, it's more of a cultural issue, and, and I think it, as, as a cultural issue, it needs time for change. You, I think Torch is, is like a great initiative in this sense, and you need time for people to get to know each other and experience themselves first time in their life, probably how good and how fruitful it is for them if they collaborate. And I think it will take time for this to, to kind of spread within the institution. You would need a lot of, I think, impersonal meetings, making friendships and understanding other people and being able to see what other people, um, how other, peop other researchers work, how other researcher teams work, if we could do some, um, some of uh, uh, mobility within uh, the institutions. I know the, all these things that I'm saying are, are uh, not working yet at the moment because of the pandemic, and who knows if they will work in the, in the next time. Yet still, I think that there is nothing uh, replacing human uh, connections, and I think building connections is the only way to, to build collaboration later on, and it's a long process. It's going to take time. Okay, thank you very much. We have to move on. Thank you very much, Sheila. Um, no, I would like to give the floor to our third speaker, Dr. Joan Camel, uh, Comella. Uh, professor Comella is a professor in molecular biology since 2007 at the Autonomous University of Barcelona and scientific director of the Wall at the Hebron University Hospital and its research institute since 2009, currently also being a member of the TORCH Quality Committee. So, Professor Camella, please deliver your talk. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this uh, meeting. I want to really thank to the, the Charm Alliance and particularly to, to Jordi Garcia for, for inviting me and try to share uh, with you some thoughts on the many learnings we have done from the COVID pandemic that I think should illuminate our future and uh, promote a stronger collaboration in research in Europe, but also globally. Uh, as has been said, I am uh, in, a, in a, a hospital managing research and innovation in this hospital. So uh, my, my thoughts will be related to the very uh, close experience in the, in the forefront of the, of the battle of this is, uh, pandemic that we have suffered for the last two years. And I would like to divide my, my short exposition in three uh, main pillars or ma three main uh, uh, topics. First one, the, pra the practical learnings on uh, how, we made what, how we made research and in the sense what we have done during this pandemic and we should continue to do. Second one, will be uh, what we have done and we should stop doing or change the way we do it. And uh, finally, the third part will be general uh, thoughts on the things that we have realized that are key to uh, successfully face a crisis. So let me, let me start with the things that we have done after my opinion correctly. First thing was uh, quite impressive how we have been able to exchange transborder data, not just in uh, science, but also in patients, the patient symptoms and responses to existing or novel medicines that we have uh, been trying uh, with sick people during the pandemic. And this has created, I will say for the first time, a really a kind of online um, way to share knowledge to improve uh, treatments for the patients. Second thing that we should keep, the bureaucratization of research. Uh, and this means authorization of doing research, 
funding, execution, and transfer to the market to reduce the time uh, of this uh, research uh, transform and arrive to the sick people, to the patients. Um, this doesn't mean that we should forget the quality standards and particularly those based on, uh, this is obvious in this, in this forum, in this forum, sorry, but we should not forget about the scientific method. Uh, an intuition, okay? And this is particularly relevant in the field of biomedicine in which the uh, checking of the case versus control studies or trials is uh, fundamental. Um, all of us uh, have uh, observed uh, miracle treatments that even very, very important people, first ministers or, or, or presidents, um, in a very informal and very serious way, uh, try to uh, uh, um, promote uh, just to think on chloroquine, uh, for example. Okay, and finally, chloroquine was discarded. Uh, third one, um, it is really important to create open and international task forces to jointly tackle. Uh, scientific and health challenges. This, uh, the COVID situation is the first time that this global task force uh, has been really implemented. And we should keep in mind that there was no uh, indication on how to do that. I mean, this is quite bottom-up experience from, from uh, the, the scientists, the, the, the medical doctors that have generated this task force. And, at the end, the government has uh, promoted and accepted and founded this, this task force in a very intuitive and very easy way, I will say. Uh, I will say. For one, uh, open and agile communication channels, both with government, go govern governmental institutions to try to uh, facilitate the arrival of the research needs that's made in the sense of bottom up but at the same time the transmission of the strategic objectives more on the government to the to the scientists that's uh, top down we should keep this kind of uh, interrelationship and this kind of uh, ways of communication five uh, the way we have set up online uh, the genome sequences of the of the of the uh, the, the virus, and this is not just um, a matter of of, of SARS COVID, uh, but this should remain. We should uh, finally and without any complex try to promote uh, the generation of fair data, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data uh, and this uh, also applies to uh, open science we should try to arrive more rapid to our colleagues again this should not be against the formal quality checks but um, i think this has been a, a completely change on how we generate the sequence of the virus and this has allowed to generate a vaccine in less than one year. Uh, six one six uh, is uh, for me the facilitate uh, fa facilitate and promote public private collaborative relationship. Uh, this is basic. Uh, I mean, I don't know any single case in which the public funding has been able to generate a a, a drug a medicine. To the market. So, without the big pharma industry, things will not work. So, I mean, we can discuss about ethics, about uh, economics, but the main message after after the pandemic is that we need to collaborate. Uh, 
We need to establish the ways to collaborate, but the public-private uh, partnership is fundamental. Seventh, promote and trust on new generation leaderships. This, I mean, the talent, the good ideas, the new ideas doesn't come forcefully from the classical uh, uh, old people. Uh, nowadays, most of the relevant and important ways to face uh, science and challenges comes from new generations that are more open-minded, uh, that, that they think out of the box, and we should try to uh, detect and promote these uh, leaderships. Eighth is uh, the transformation, the way we work both individually in organizational models that need to be uh, very easily adapted to new challenges, but also infrastructures, okay? It's not just a matter of people, but also a matter of uh, uh, infrastructures. I mean, uh, not just uh, technical infrastructure, but even organizations, how we are more plastic to face these challenges. Uh, ninth is, is obvious for all of us, is how we have changed the way we work, how uh, the digitalization has entered in our lives. This has come to remain, at least in part. This has facilitated meetings, has facilitated uh, contacts, change of, uh, in, uh, of information. And I think Zoom or equivalents uh, have been arrive to stay for long, but not everything is, is perfect. I think we lack face-to-face -face meetings, uh, especially for, for, for Congresses like this one. I think we are losing, in that sense, the value to interact each other, the, the networking, uh, to take a cup, a cup of coffee with someone close to you from this time, the, from this type of uh, contacts, uh, usually um, generate uh, important challenges. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, another thing that has completely changed is the the the, the way we uh, face uh, our lives, our industrial or our productive life, from the very important and uh, uh, current uh, a scenario of just in time to a model of just in case a scenario. Okay, I can I can also develop on on this if you want. Okay, let's move to what we have done and should I stop doing or change the way we do it. Uh, first thing we have failed to take pandemic prevention and be prepared really seriously. We have realized that we, we, we don't have contingency plans. I, I know that this is very difficult to, to face because uh, there are many, many things that could, uh, could uh, uh, happen, but uh, it, it is not, uh, how to say, it's not, realistic to think that there are some things that are coming and we are not really prepared. I, I'm thinking, for example, in, 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 in weather change, for example. In that sense, um, in that sense, uh, I also want to stress that um, the way we uh, do science is, is not on on uh, how to say is not uh, just the mainstream we should found science in as much as diverse uh, specialties that we could come because we cannot uh, 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 foresee what will be the really next challenge okay second thing is it's about uh, about a, a non-equitable access to vaccines. It is not. Uh, it is not a proper. I will say that rich countries have surplus of vaccines, 
and others uh, are unable to vaccinate his people. I mean, if, if we are globally, we should also be globally for that. Okay. Um, another point is how we manage uh, intellectual property uh, rights or intellectual property regulations. Uh, there has been a proposal that uh, of doing intellectual property waiver to allow countries to do generic versions of vaccines. And, and I think I think that's a good thing. Uh, we, we, we don't have uh, we, we haven't been able to generate this waiver uh, till very recently, two years after. And, in, and even in that case is, is under discussion. But um, we should think on 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 relaxing uh, those rights uh, in the uh, in the in the crisis. And this rise, uh, and this is very sensible uh, issue, and, uh, and 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 how this should be implemented. Who should pay for this relaxation? This this should be on the back of the companies, or or the government should pay, or the uh, who should pay? The the, the World Health Organization. Uh, I, I think we should put those those issues in the table and try to. To get some, um, how to say, to, uh, some agreement for for the next crisis that will come. I'm, I'm not sure if in the in in the in the vaccine fields or in the treatments or in the drugs, whatever. And uh, also, uh, I want to stress that we uh, our communication of uh, of science uh, to the society is suboptimal. To be uh, uh, to be clear. We should improve the way we transmit information to citizens and policymakers, and focus our narratives uh, uh, in ways to 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 be easily understandable, and uh, close to the human experiences, and focus on societal impact. And related to this, uh, and I think it's very important to stress that science matters, but to take decisions, scientists are not just the only player. There are many other players and particularly governments and society. And just to finish, I want to share some, some general thoughts on, on, on what are to me the key, the key uh, factors to, to face the crisis. First one, without knowledge-based society, we cannot face present and upcoming challenges or find an innovative solutions to tackle them. Second is about funding research and innovation in a wide uh, range of themes, as, as I say. We don't know how will be the next uh, challenge. We thought for many, many uh, time, and this was on the table of the founding agencies, that the major problems were chronic diseases, Alzheimer, diabetes, etc. But suddenly, everything uh, was challenged by a severe and a highly transmissible uh, respiratory diseases that nobody could expect. You know, so uh, what we, uh, how we should face that, just by funding good science in as many as fields as possible. Uh, just to keep in mind that uh, the vaccines were related for a non-very fashion. Uh, work, uh, how to generate vaccines from RNA, uh, a work of uh, 30 years that was underfunded uh, uh, during this time. Third one is generous leadership and cross-sectorial collaborations. Future will be interdisciplinary collaboration, for sure. We have also learned that. And. Uh, uh, just to finish, we need a societal debate on how to use clinical data for the advancement of research. We are uh, very focused on GDPR, on our privacy, but at the same time, we uh, generously share very important personal data in uh, uh, social uh, uh, networks. You know, So I think we should put that in the table on how, how we'll deal with that. And uh, and we the final message is that we should count on a generous society. I think our societies, our species, is generous. 
even those days uh, doesn't seem to be the case in the in the east of Europe. But you know, when you face uh, what happened with the with the pandemic at the level of the industry, at the level of the academia, at the level of the citizens, at the level of individuals, I think that human beings are good good uh, animals, if you want. So we should count on that. You know, I want to to stress that final message in in the current and terrible situation on on Ukraine. So uh, let's face and let's see the future as a, a, a brilliant future. And that's that's my my points. And uh, thank you again very much. I, I I know that this this has not been very how to say very academic or very formal, but uh, I think that our personal reflections based on my, our day by day in the last two years. And uh, I think it's important to transmit those uh, thoughts uh, on an audience like this one of today that has um, a very uh, rich mix, mixture of, of people that have strong responsibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joan. I think uh, what you summarized was very important also for the TORCH initiative, and it comes from a real practice of the last uh, two years, nearly two years, uh, scientific activities in connection with COVID. Um, we have time for a short question. It's, I have to say that it's very difficult to me to see any questions, so I, I just ask one question. Um, you mentioned very important things about communication of science to policymakers. Uh, I, I myself see um, a, a bit of a change uh, uh, and more respect of scientists in, in terms of policy making. But what was your experience in practice uh, in, with regard of COVID uh, when communications uh, to policy makers and what are your recommendations? I'm not sure to understood your your question. Uh, yeah, it was quite one repeat. Uh, what I understood is uh, how was our experience in communication uh, science to the the policymakers? That the question. That was the question. Okay, so uh, you know uh, our experience was uh, very positive uh, in the sense that uh, I, I think. Science scientists have been a major role in this pandemic at very different levels, at the level of um, epidemics, the way of the curves were predicted, and usually they, they, they were right, but also on, uh, on, 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 on the knowledge that we, what we could expect, we were permanently, not, not myself, but uh, the scientists around us were permanently asked by the policymakers how to, to manage the situation. So, but as I say, uh, this, this is very, very interesting point. I mean, uh, science, scientists, we don't have all the answers for all the questions related to the pandemic. So, uh, and this has been a kind of crash between opinions, for example, uh, uh, related to what, from a point of view, as from a scientific point of view, should be done, as compared as uh, uh, to 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 the economic crisis. And this is a kind of balance, you know. But but uh, I think yes, uh, we have been heard by the politicians. Second thing that I want also to stress here is uh, there are some kind of um, uh, divas, uh, some kind of uh, people that love to to make uh, opinion of everything, including scientists. You know, so scientists we should be very careful on 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 generating our opinion and to transmit our opinion just in those. Uh, situation and those cases on which we are really an ex we are really experts. We cannot uh, uh, 
have an opinion on everything. I, I don't know, I, I have nothing about vaccines, for example, you know? So I think it's very important that uh, someone that is an expert on vaccines uh, could talk about vaccines, but not about epidemics, you know? And on vice versa, uh, people that are very good on, on epidemics uh, have put on the table their opinions on the uh, relevance to generate vaccines from RNA, for example. So I think we should be very careful on that. Otherwise, we, we lose our, our authority, our academic authority, you know? And the third, uh, third thing that I want to stress is that we should adapt our, our uh, narrative to the, to, the, to the audience. I mean, we cannot thought on talking about, uh, I don't know, vaccines, as uh, talking about vaccines to the general public to promote the vaccination as we are talking to our colleagues in the field of the va vaccines in, a, in an international congress. And so uh, those capacities should be promoted and generated uh, inside the academia, inside the, the research field. We are very good in communicating, communicating very technically, but we need to do an effort to, to to transmit the same knowledge in a more easy way, in a more narrative way for the different publics. I am not sure if I have answered your questions. Uh, yeah, thank, you case, very much. Case, thank you for okay. the answers. Uh, we have to move on. And let me introduce our last speaker of this session, uh, Professor uh, Jordi Garcia, the Vice Director of Research at Barcelona University. Um, please give you a talk. Uh, okay, no, thank you. Uh, I, I was mute. Uh, so thank you very much. I will be very, very short because we are running out of time. Uh, basically, uh, I, I was taking notes of all the all the things. Uh, I would recommend, uh, I see that uh, Dr. Karamali, I think she's not connected now, but uh, uh, it would be very interesting to have her presentation distributed on Torch PMT because uh, she said very, very interesting things on the future of the thoughts of the European Union about several things, about the, the research careers, the, this seems that new ERC for institution, uh, research of excellence, and so on and so forth. So I would really love that. Uh, with respect to the main theme of, the, of, the, of this plenary session, I think that Professor Comella, <coughs> uh, yes, I said, 90% of what I would have liked to say, uh, Professor Steger also uh, said very interesting things that uh, we have in her presentation. But just uh, for example, with regards to the Juan Cumella, the last question was about how we communicate. And, and it will be the subject of one of the panels this afternoon of the talk, so that would be great. It's extremely important. Also, he put the example of RNA vaccines that uh, were based on the studies of RNA uh, 20 years ago that were not funded. And <clears throat> this is why I, I, I would like to stress the importance of research, research in the wide sense. We not, uh, the research is not applied, so we cannot get a vaccine after one year if there is not a big base of research that we call basic research. I would love an example of a scientist that in the 70s was working in the Yellowstone Park in the United States studying some bacteria that live at 80 degrees temperature. That was in the 70s. This most probably would have not been funded today, but then after studying how these bacteria replicate, now, Today, everywhere know what a PCR is. The PCR technique comes from the studies of a strange bacteria of 40 years ago. Also, another woman called Barbara McClintock was studying why maize have different colors. This ended up with the discovery of transposons that at the end <coughs> helped to analyze how the immunoglobulin genes in humans work and this is uh, in part the explanation of how the antibodies work. And now today, everybody knows what the antigen test is and what an antibody 
is. So I think that we have to stress that science is not only the last uh, point of the pyramid, but science needs uh, a big base. Also, uh, Professor Tomeya said, but it, uh, and I will be very telegraphic, one, the importance of close contact between scientists, of interdisciplinarity. He said a cup of coffee, as I was trained in the British uh, um, science for some time, I would say the, the tea time. The tea time in England is absolutely key to discuss with people that is around you in a relaxing manner and helping uh, this inter and transdisciplinary working on. And the very, very last thing, and I would, I love that he said that, is that the research, the important research, what they call the quaking research, is a matter of the young, of the young scientists. And I think that at all levels, Torch, CHARM, European Union, national funding ministers, we have to promote the people, the young people, who is the ones that uh, will, will help uh, in the real advance of science. So it was some, uh, simply my very last comments, and I think we ran out three time, three minutes of time, so it's quite, quite well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jordi. And now we have a nearly 12 minutes break. We are coming back to the panel session at 11.45 with the European universities towards a reform of research assessment system. This section will be chaired by Doris Alexander. So please come back at 11.45. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we move on to the next uh, session, uh, session uh, panel three. As you know, the main objective of TORCH project is to build up a research and innovation dimension of CHARM EU. This task includes the alignment of our policies and practices with European initiatives. One of the pressing issues on the European research agenda is the question of research assessment reform. At today's forum, we would like to get a picture of how the European Union is approaching it and what we can learn from the work of the university, European University Alliances. The following panel discussion is dedicated to these issues. Now I would like to give the word to Doris Alexander, Associate Director of European Engagement at Trinity College Dublin, who will chair this discussion. Thank you and good morning everyone and welcome to this uh, panel session uh, towards a reform of the research assessment system. So let me first of all introduce to you the panel, then I'll make a few remarks. I won't, I was going to show a few slides, I'm not going to do that in the interests of time and then I will hand over to the first speaker. So on our panel today we have Professor Ludovic Thilly, which I think we all know. Uh, so Ludovic is chair of the Coimbra Group. But he's also chair of the 4EU2 informal network of European University Alliances. So that's those 24 university alliances funded through the second pilot call. And of course, he's also coordinator of the e EC2U European University Alliance through his own university, University of Poitiers. Uh, so we will hear today from uh, Ludovic around the challenges and benefits associated with research assessment reform. And of course, Ludovic is also, as is Frank, a, a member of the core panel working with the European Commission um, on the process of moving towards a reform of the research assessment system. So we'll hear a little bit more about that as well. Then following that, we're going to hear two presentations um, from alliances that are part of the 4EU1, uh, a grouping of European University Alliances, about their experiences. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Dr. Anouk Tsu. I'm, I think I probably pronounced your name incorrectly there. Apologies, apologies to everybody on the panel. Um, and you're representing Epicure, um, and your home university is the University of Amsterdam, um, where Anouk is the Director of International uh, Affairs there, and has a lot of experience in terms of initiating and maintaining alliances and international engagement. So we're very much looking forward to hearing uh, the experience of Epicure in that regard. And then following that, we have Dr. Thulio Vardenica, um, who is representing today Arcus. Um, Julio Tulio himself is an associate professor 
in the University of Padova. Uh, and I looked uh, at your bio and I also noticed that you lecture in, amongst other things, uh, computing education. Of course, that's, that's a whole other uh, a question, but very much part and parcel of the needs for digital and green transition. So we're much linked into that. And then following that last, but by no means least, again, a, another very familiar face, I think, to a lot of us is, is Professor Dr. Frank Miedema from, uh, again, I probably pronounced that incorrectly, from Utrecht University. And Utrecht, of course, is also, thank you, is also a, a member of uh, Charm EU. Uh, as indeed am I. So today through the panel session, we are hoping to have a little bit of a better understanding about the challenges and the benefits associated uh, with the research assessment reform. Frank will be talking about the experience of, of Utrecht because in a sense, they very much pioneered this already. So their experiences, which are, it's very useful for us to hear about. Um, but also in terms of, and this is going back to what Leah Caramelli spoke earlier on, Understanding the political context and the political agenda within which this research assessment reform sits. So, as Leah mentioned, we have this European research area um, strategy agenda, strategic agenda for 2022 to 2024, 20 priority action areas there, of which one, action number three, is actually a reform of the research assessment system. And that goes across the entire ecosystem. So it's not just for, for research performing organizations, it's also for research funders, it's for researchers itself. You can't reform unless we all reform. But there's great connectivity across the different um, action areas. So another action area within the European research area is, of course, gender equality and inclusion. And we need to make sure that that's reflected in relation to any reform of the research assessment system. Looking at how to promote and sustain and have attractive research careers is very much linked also into how we assess uh, research. And even if you look at Action 17, which is around increasing the strategic capacity of research performing organisations, that has to go hand in hand with research assessment reform. If we are looking to reward certain behaviours, if we're looking to incentivise certain behaviours, and if we're looking to reflect the diversity of ways in which we conduct research, then the research performing organisations must have the correct supports in place for that. So over the last year, there's been a lot of consultation occurring with the European Commission around research assessment reform. You know, what does it mean? What's the objective? And of course, the objective is to increase the quality and the impact of research, but to move away a little bit from this indicative, quantifiable indicators to how we can take on board qualitative indicators, and also to look at how we conduct research and the diversity and make sure that that's reflected back. Whether it's monodisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, whether it's conducted by research, one person, whether it's conducted within a team, all of that needs to be reflected back into any reform um, of the system. And lastly, before I hand over to Ludovic, I think we're all aware here that actually the European universities have been doing a great deal of work in this regard through our SWAFs projects. Some of the alliances have been addressing directly strengthening human capital and alternative reward systems. Even those that have not have been addressing other transformational module areas, such as open science, and um, such as looking at how we work with enterprise and engage with citizens. And of course, those are all stepping stones to a reform of the research assessment system. So as was uh, mentioned earlier, we are stronger together. We can actually work stronger together by transferring ideas and, and, and outputs and, and, idea, and ways that have worked or indeed that haven't worked. So without much ado, I'm now going to hand over to Ludwig and very, very interested to hear his presentation. I've had a glimpse of it already and I think you're going to very much enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doris, um, uh, for the very kind and actually very also relevant uh, introduction to, to this very important topic. Um, well, just I would briefly like to, to mention that I would like to express my support to Ukrainian people and Ukrainian academics, uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I know that we all have uh, this in mind, but I just wanted uh, to, to mention it. I will now share my presentation uh, and you will uh, confirm that you 
to see it, please uh, tell me. Yes, is that okay? Excellent. Yeah, so, so to, this morning I will uh, briefly expose the, the views from the Coimbra Group. Uh, you know actually that there is a very close connection between the Charm EU and the Coimbra Group uh, in, the, in the sense that the uh, Coimbra Group uh, is actually officially associated partner to the Charm EU Alliance and I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, at this event today and I, I warmly thank you all for uh, having us uh, on board. Um, I would like to start by maybe uh, in a way exposing uh, how the Coimbra Group is uh, involved in this uh, very important topic and in a way that's uh, uh, reflecting the, the, the current process going on at the, the, the Commission and uh, I was uh, unfortunately not able to be uh, earlier today so I don't know if Elia uh, Karamali presented the whole process but basically the Coimbra Group has been involved from the very start and will continue to be so. Uh, it started with uh, an active participation to the consultation phase which was organized by the Commission last year. This phase actually led to the scoping report, which has been published and that you can actually also find uh, at the link uh, on the Commission uh, website uh, that you can uh, see here. And on that page, actually, you will see a lot of uh, aspects that I will uh, actually present now. We, we as Coimbra Group have been also promoting the uh, still open call uh, to organization for being part of the coalition of uh, willing or coalition uh, on the reforming research uh, assessment. And as you mentioned, Mentioned, Doris, we are now a member of the core group that is uh, uh, working with the drafting team uh, to present later this year the draft agreements that will be uh, proposed to uh, the community. We had already two meetings, uh, two in February, there will be one uh, in mid-March. And uh, you can also see on the web page all the, the members uh, from the core group and Frank is indeed a part of them as well. Uh, and it's a delight to, to share ideas and discussion with him and the other colleagues. And we are going to accompany also the discussions during the so-called stakeholders assemblies. And there is the first one tomorrow uh, morning. So actually the uh, institutions who expressed uh, the, 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 the idea to join the coalition of willing uh, have been actually invited to participate to this uh, stakeholders assembly tomorrow. What I'm going to present you now uh, are really the, the different aspects of the views that we uh, presented already to the Commission and uh, that we uh, are, are trying to, to get on board during the, the drafting of this uh, very important agreement for the future of the research assessment. Uh, first, we, I think, all agree that this is indeed a very timely uh, initiative um, that uh, really will allow uh, to, to not only uh, foster the discussion or, or uh, continue the discussion at universities where this reform has started, but also to promote a fresh discussion at the ones that have not yet embarked into this journey. So again, very timely initiative. We believe, and, and hopefully this, this will continue to be the case, that th this will remain a bottom-up, flexible uh, approach where we really uh, aim at committing uh, to concrete actions. It, it should not be only a catalogue of goodwills, but really proposing actions. Otherwise, nothing will be changed. And as uh, we can see here, it's a much-needed change. Um, we, we need clearly, and you mentioned this, Doris, uh, we need the transition from quantitative to more qualitative assessment of research and researchers. Uh, there is also, this is also an opportunity to address what we call the disciplinary injustice uh, that can indeed uh, lead to different uh, recognitions uh, regarding the different disciplines according to their practices, uh, etc. This is also a very important opportunity to address the gender bias in research, including during the assessment uh, process. And uh, we believe this is also a very good starting point for uh, the mainstreaming of open science through, in particular, an emphasis on quality and equity. The main challenges that we have identified, and I think also this, this is uh, reflected in the scoping report, uh, is that uh, we should uh, be careful in second, setting up a framework that really, uh, that really will respect the autonomy of institutions and allowing flexibility and differences in the implementation. But of course, this requires a systemic transformation 
uh, where really all the stakeholders can really co uh, co create co implement uh, and, and there is a very strong need on interdisciplinary leadership we should not forget the legal aspects which will be inherent to any reform of such uh, research assessment system uh, we know there is a diversity in europe and we need to take this uh, into account of course uh, what we also mentioned several times is that there will be no change if the reform has a negative impact on the funding and on the careers of the researchers. Basically, we cannot do the reform without the researchers. They are at the core of this uh, challenge. Uh, also possibly, but maybe uh, slightly aside, uh, there, there, there is maybe some issues related, related to languages for and of publication and the, the role of English uh, uh, among other uh, aspects. Among the, the succession solutions that we propose, and we will see if indeed the, the, the drafting team and the, the core group aim at the same uh, objectives, uh, we, we strongly believe uh, that uh, such agreement should be led by example. Uh, and we need also to really build the collective sense of belonging. And actually, I'm pretty sure that uh, the, the uh, intervention from Frank today will be a, a typical example of uh, this approach. Uh, also, we should make sure that uh, any monitoring mechanism uh, that will be organized uh, should uh, really elaborate uh, on how to equip uh, our communities and researchers with effective tools. Uh, this is very important. We cannot let them alone. Uh, it, it should be really uh, strongly accompanied. And on, also, uh, this uh, remark uh, is true for the organizations themselves. Uh, it, it's uh, really needed to equip the whole community with the right tools. Um, what is also important is that anything that will be changed should be very well described, supported by uh, uh, proofs and data, and, and effectively communicated and widely uh, accessible. Uh, but of course, this uh, discussion should not only be restricted to uh, the signatories. It should be really a much more open debate uh, that in particular include, and this is particularly important, uh, particularly important for the Coimba Group, that the early stage researchers, as well as uh, who will become the future senior academics, are also very strongly uh, engaged in this discussion. They will have a role in particular in the sustainability of uh, this reform. Um, we also believe that uh, we need some support instrument for the reform. It cannot, cannot only be uh, supported by the institutions themselves. There should be some tools at the Commission level, at the European level, in particular some very comprehensive information website. There should be a sort of platform where all the, this, the progress can be discussed and shared among the, the, the stakeholders. Uh, we propose, for instance, to setting up a bank of experts, uh, also a bank of training materials, because this will not be a real game changer if there is not any training of the whole community. Uh, there should be some incentives. Uh, it should be also strongly linked to other frameworks. In particular, we should not drop out the uh, Human Resources Strategy for Researchers, HRS for R, but there are also other uh, frameworks to be uh, kept. And we should, and this is a sort of repetition to my previous comment, we should target researchers at all career stages. Now, we are, of course, expecting much more details on the final version of the European agreement. We believe that there should be also some sort of international alignment with the rest of the world, because, of course, by nature, our uh, uh, European research is connected to the global research. And again, it should be strongly linked to uh, other type of uh, activities, DORA, uh, HRS for R, etc. I would like now to maybe just uh, quickly add two more slides to just now make the link with the alliances. So you can see here the logos from the 41 alliances. And indeed, uh, it should be uh, very, very well recognized that alliances of European universities, well, as we all know, they address all the missions of the knowledge square, including research and innovation. It has been now fully recognized that there are potential test beds for systemic change in uh, European higher education, but also in European research area. 
And indeed, they are supported by the so-called Horizon 2020 SWAFs funds. And when we look at the diversities, diversity of activities within these H2020 SWAFs project, we clearly see that a lot of alliances have actually proposed to develop new activities regarding the development of new metrics in research, new, new peer review methods, also a better recognition of SSH and our artistic research, uh, a promotion of gender equality in research, career development strategies, and of course, the promotion of open and citizen science. Therefore, it is indeed particularly relevant to discuss this potential re research uh, assessment reform in the context of the alliances that are exactly the best location to discuss these uh, because of these uh, specificities. So I will stop here and I very much look forward to uh, the other contributions today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ludovic. In the interests of time, I'm going to move directly over to Anouk because I know you have a train to catch, so we don't want to leave you too uh, on the platform seeing the train going off in the distance. So please. Uh, thank you, Doris, uh, and thank you so much to all colleagues at Charm and Torch uh, for having me and um, being interested in Epicur's approach. Uh, I can run really fast too, Doris, and so I will be starting by speaking rapidly um, and show you something uh, of the work Epicur has been doing. I would also like to um, share in Ludovic's comments on the situation in Ukraine and surrounding regions and mention that our thoughts are also right now with our friends, students and academics here at our campuses who are affected by this. Uh, but nevertheless, we will carry on with our important work also for them. Um, so I'll bring up um, my slides um, to show you a little bit about um, what Epicur has been doing. Uh, I'm not so used to WebEx, so I hope you can see them all right. Yes, we can. Great. Thanks for confirming that. Well, um, I think many of the things um, that um, have been said apply to the Epicur Alliance as well. So um, that's music to my ears, uh, and I will also refer back uh, to that during my presentation. Epicur, just like Charm, is one of the um, first generation alliances selected in the 2019 call. Initially, we started off with eight members from six European countries. We recently expanded with a ninth partner, the University of Southern Denmark. So we are now based in seven European countries, and who knows what will come next. Um, similar to CHARM, uh, we um, are working on a top of uh, research funding project funded by Horizon 2020 in the SWAF strand, um, and that builds on top of our experiences in the Erasmus Plus pilot on education. And uh, Epicur is specifically working on shaping European society in transition, because we think that that is where the alliances can contribute mostly by experimenting and deploying new approaches. And our specific focus is on creating proof of concepts for inter and transdisciplinary research approaches with and for European society. And we work um, specifically also for the group of early career researchers. And I think Ludovic already alluded to this because we believe that they are the future change makers, especially also when it comes uh, to the topic of our panel today. If we want to change the reform system, we need to start with this group because for them it matters most. And um, I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but for the established researchers who are further on in their career, um, it may be uh, a bit different uh, to change the system retroactively. So we really think we should be forward looking. And of course, it would involve researchers in all stages. So what will Epicur do to establish um, these changes? We uh, work on three experimental collaborative formats. So we call them, we have an epi language because we're also multilingual, the epi community, the epi clusters and epi connect. In brief, they are focused on inter, intra alliance networking and networking with industry and societal partners and governmental partners. And also epi connect is uh, set up to build cross alliances and network to network connections uh, like with Charm and Torch. Um, on the other side, we work on um, a support system for supporting new ways for researcher assessments, the topic at hand today. Our first result that I will be showing you is the uh, model assessment framework for researcher assessment, which we call EPIQSS. And at the moment, we are preparing to deploy this in a gamified context, and that is called EPIGAME, but that is for the future. 
Um, why are we working on this? Well, I think I am speaking uh, to an audience that is partial filled with believers. <laughs> um, so we all need that we need, we all know that we need uh, the change in culture, really, academic culture. We would like to create academic homes for our researchers, future and current ones that are attractive, uh, that uh, nurture creativity, that feel safe and are inclusive. And we should focus on the needs of our human capital. Um, at the moment, um, the existing tools are not sufficiently catering for these needs. For example, the acknowledgement of specific competencies and skills are very hard to make tangible in um, metric-based quantitative only frameworks. So for this reason, we also signal that there is a demand for practical models to help universities and networks to achieve these objectives, as Ludovic also already mentioned in the context of the European Commission's effort. Uh, and what Epicur would like to do in the context also in response to European Council conclusions is to offer a practical tool to test these new practice and see what will happen in the institutional context when you do change things. Um, so what are the guiding of the key characteristics of EPIQSS? Well, um, we did not want to produce any additional policy paper because there are very many good policy papers in place. So we uh, undertook quite a robust context analysis and decided that we would propose an actionable approach that is flexible and dynamic. Um, it starts uh, from, uh, from the starting point of the researcher perspective, especially the early career researcher one, but also all the other stages, as it covers the entire career life cycle. It's multidimensional, and by this we mean that it covers the knowledge square, so all four areas. I will say more about that in a second. Um, we marry together quantitative and qualitative criteria. So we did not choose out of principle for qualitative criteria only because we think some of the quantitative ones also have merit and are very useful to uh, make things tangible and also to further develop. We should not necessarily move away entirely from the existing system. And finally, we hope that the framework will be adaptable and flexible enough to cater for all disciplines, but this is something that we will find out when we pilot things. So uh, the structure in a picture, um, EPIQSS is on the one hand focused on institutional change, but also uh, applicable for individual researchers and research groups who would like to work with it. The four dimensions um, are overlapping with the four dimensions of the knowledge square, so research, innovation, teaching and learning and service to society, but they are all measured equally on equal footing. So there's no hierarchy uh, and they are also adaptable. So for example, if a researcher would like to focus more in, on developing entrepreneurial skills, then the weighting of innovation may increase depending on the situation of an assessment context. All categories include core criteria, specific criteria, and notes on personal qualities to help acknowledging specific competences that would fall beyond regular criteria. I mentioned the flexibility, the adaptability, and also the fact that it's very practical and intended to inspire local uptake and implementation, and perhaps also wider uptake, depending on your interest, for example. Um, then a picture of how we pulled this all together, and it's a public deliverable, by, by the way, so very soon we will be able to share the entire document with you via the Epica website. But as I mentioned, um, the uh, entire career track um, is central to the way we approach um, the dimensions. And for each career stage, we indicated for the four knowledge square dimensions, what core criteria could look like in each stage, what specific criteria could be, and which personal qualities matter most. Um, so you can think about, for example, um, that for early career researchers, um, open science skills could be something important to develop. Um, so alongside core criteria in terms of the ability to perform research at a high academic level, a specific criteria could be developments of skills in open science and open data practices. Um, the same could be true for someone who is in his or her PhD phase and already interested in developing a more entrepreneurial career path. In that case, more emphasis could be given to uh, skills related to innovation, for example, seeking third party funding, theme science, 
and so on and so forth. So um, actually the, the set of criteria is something researchers and institutions could play with if they are really creative and make it work for themselves. So actually we flip the whole concept that used to be very top down and quantitative around, centered around the researchers and the specific need to see if by um, making sure that they are also more in control, we could offer a more developmental perspective and if this is sufficient to ignite change within research groups, but also within institutions. Well, what will happen next? Because of course we would like to move beyond theoretical commitments as we all do. Um, we would like to bring the assessment framework to life. Uh, there are four levels we are thinking of. First of all, deploying the principles of the framework in the EPI community that we're currently building with active input of our EPI early career researcher board. So it's on the basis of their needs. We're building a, a public a space for them to um, network, to do peer-to-peer -peer assessments and to uh, expose their profiles the way in which they find important. So not necessarily in ways publishers find important, but for their specific career stage. And we are assess that ourselves as many alliances. We also encourage institutional transformation of our members. So several pilots will be running the coming years to deploy the framework uh, at departments, at faculties, at research groups to see if it works or needs to be redesigned. We would like to create structural impact, hopefully, if other alliances would be interested in take up part of the framework. So this is also an open invitation to all alliances to get in touch with Epicure if you're interested or other types of networks. And finally, and I think this is very much linked to Ludovic's speech, we would like to use it to proactively influence policy. Uh, because this is the time and we have something very concrete in our hands and maybe the core group or the European Commission would be interested in learning more uh, and we would be happy to contribute to those ongoing interactions. I think that's all for me now. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you Anouk and I hope we haven't left you too late for the train. Uh, I think it's okay. Um, did I manage to unshare my screen? Uh, no, we can still see your screen oh. actually. Let me see. All right. This is the other screen. Thank you. Thank you so sorry. much. And, and uh, I am sorry that you can't stay for the panel discussion at the, at the end, but um, I think that there was a, a really useful presentation. Of course, it, it, it links the, the research assessment as part and parcel of career assessment, which is really important that it's not uh, divorced. Um, from that. So thank you very much Anouk, for that. So I'm now going to pass over to um, uh, Tulio Verdanica, who's going to be speaking on behalf of Arcus. Uh, welcome, Tulio. Can't actually hear you. I think I mute me. Now you're hearing now me. Now you're fine. You? Okay, so I can speak and I can show. Very good. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> I'm speaking on behalf of this uh, Arcus RI, Research and Innovation. Uh, Arcus is an Erasmus Plus project by other alliances. Arcus RI is a CSA project under Horizon 2020. And in a sense, it's part of Arcus. It's the same alliance, but it is also uh, a different brand in a way. It has been constructed to help Arcus, but with a focus specifically on research and innovation on research. You see on the uh, top right part of the of chart, I'm showing the composition of the alliance. You see now it has nine partners, two of them, Nino and Roslav, came in uh, very recently, and they are not yet in the Arcus RI. So they were adding themselves onto the Erasmus Plus part of the story. The reason why they're not in the Arcus RI is that the instrument, the CSA that we're using, makes it difficult financially to add partners along the way. This is not so important. So you, you, you look at the chart, what it covers. So it's a variety of institutions, higher education institutions for size, country, for history, from lo for local culture. Um, 
my role in the project, um, as Doris was saying, I'm an associate professor in computer science. Um, my role in the project was to lead the activity on research assessment. So I, I, I took, uh, if you like, uh, a responsibility in that one, not because it is my research task, but because I feel very strongly about the topic and I did some you know, investigation together with others. But I'm speaking not on, on my own behalf, I'm speaking on behalf of the group that did the study. So that you understand uh, where we came from in this and what I'm going to tell you, which is uh, on slide three and which will be the, 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 the bulk of my contribution here, hopefully stealing a little bit of discussion for the um, open part of the panel. Uh, it was a small effort in comparison to the big initiatives that produced very important work, you know, uh, open papers that are around. Ours was a very tiny, tiny exercise. You know? And we had to understand our small size, what impact we could have. You know? Our institutions didn't give us mandate to define the research assessment policy of the future. Our institutions allowed us to exist, to put it uh, ironically. And the best we could achieve is uh, make proposals, you know, stimulate some degree of internal reflection so that the research assessment practices of the future would become better able, better equipped at recognizing, retaining, and at attracting talent, genuine talent and multidimensional talent. So the, the bounds within which we operated was to reflect and cause reflection to continue within our partner institution, hopefully higher in the uh, level of responsibility and authority within uh, in our institutions. One thing I noticed, and I think it's important, at least it was important to me, so I'm just candidly sharing it with you, is that the team we had in this effort uh, was uh, mixed in the sense that we had people from the research support office of the institutions and we had actual researchers. Now, I don't want to create a barrier or the impression that there is a barrier between the two, but it's quite evident but it is a different feel, there is a different understanding, there is a different perception of what this research assessment challenge is between the two camps. So it was an effort to come to a decent uh, common understanding of the problem boundaries. So what, what, what were the premises of our investigation? I think I don't have to spend time on this because they are very evident. Um, they are item one and two in this particular slide. So the criteria which are dominant, not, not that every institution has exactly the same criteria, there, there are variations. I'm happy to see that in Europe, where we're looking at as a continent, there are institutions, not even within the Arctic Alliance, that have made very interesting progress on changing this uh, wrong angle, if you like, but the dominant criteria really have very serious defects. I will not be uh, reading the text, you can read it for yourself if you want to care uh, for reading it, otherwise I think you know that very well already, so I don't have to mention any of this. And this was the starting point. It, it is not an accusation to institution, it, it's only a, 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 an observation of reality and of, uh, there are reasons why it went that way, reasons that can be understood, reasons that have even a decent rationale, but the outcomes, the situation nowadays has shown uh, how really defective this is. So what could we do? What was the focus of our investigation? Was This is written at the bottom, the bo bottom uh, item in this slide, was to try and identify practices, sustainable practices, that widen the recognition of research projects and their mode of delivery. 
So going away from a stale, standard chicken farm style of, you know, defining what research products are and what their modes of delivery are. And what we did to do our job in the project was to um, post questions for our own institutions. And perhaps these questions could be also of interest to some of you. So now we are going uh, up the ladder of our uh, institutional governance, governance across the, the, the partners in the Alliance. And we are posting these specific questions phrased in a more elaborate manner. Now for the sake of you reading the slide, without spending too much time uh, crossing words and, and with your eyes, I made uh, them very summary, mm -hmm. very uh, simple in a sense. So these five questions are going now to the, uh, our own institutions, and we are going to collect the answers from the seven plus two institutions and then try and see if there is anything that they feel about any of them, wherever there is a common position in the um, angle at which we are looking at these uh, various questions, if there are differences, why there are differences, if there are commonalities, how strong, how deep, how uh, intensive these commonalities are so that the alliance could be made stronger by feeling the same way, by viewing the same way in the transition. I don't think I should be reading the five questions. I think you can read them yourselves and you don't want me to tell you what they are. But you understand, uh, hopefully, what, but what we're asking is very much in the scope of what this uh, uh, annual forum is about. It's not all of the scope of the annual forum. It's pertinent to a large extent, so I'm happy to see what it is. And we try to make these questions um, sufficiently concrete, we, we st strove really to try and have engaged our institutions to give us a concrete answer, not just you know, a, a political one, say, well, we do believe it, no, but the moment is difficult or something. We wanted something that would be understandable, that would have uh, a meaning in a bottom-up direction that would relate to what researchers actually do, that would speak across the career stage and not just, you know, being directed to only one part of those, and have uh, pointers to in initiatives that already are in place in, in institutions or in, in our own countries or that are coming uh, on the European continent. And this is where I stop. You know? So this, uh, the, these, are, these five questions are um, our own, you know, posting to the institutions, and perhaps they also find a role in this panel today. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and I should have said at the outset, um, there is, of course, the possibility to pose questions. And if you would like to do so, there is actually a, a should be a button on the bottom right of your screen to do that. You could either address it to the panel per se, or if you want to address it to a person in particular, perhaps you could indicate that uh, in, in the question. I know we're running slightly behind schedule. We did have a slightly late start, so I beg your indulgence on that. And I'm now going to pass over to our last panel uh, speaker, um, Frank, whom I actually think I neglected to say at the outset that you're the Vice Rector for Research at Utrecht. You University. I did say you were in Utrecht, but I also wanted to say that you were one of the initiators in 2013 of Science in Transition, uh, which I think is very relevant in this regard, um, understanding and believing that the academic incentive and reward system was in need of fundamental uh, reform. So very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Just try again. We didn't hear you the first time. No, it's okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, vice rector, yeah, somebody has to do it, right? Um, so um, uh, I will. I will only spend say a couple of minutes because uh, most of it has been said and very uh, adequately and eloquently. Uh, and so I am not going to repeat it. And I also see I saw the, the last speaker who who was showing how to, how to get a feel for what's going on in the institutions. And this is also what we do in Charm still, and we do in 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 several uh, in Leary as well. Uh, and I think in Coimbra, we are just exchanging where are we, uh, what's the lay of the land, we say. I would just 
I say say I, I didn't uh, there's a lot I will put in the chat uh, some links to my presentations then and people have more time and on their own time to, to look at it um, um, I would say the first thing I want to say is uh, research evaluation and recognition and rewards that's not an HRM tool it is eventually an HRM tool but in the beginning it is uh, it is a need to really change science the way we want science to operate and uh, Ludwig has, has been saying that but this is, of course, very, very close to my heart. So we have to keep in mind research evaluation has a higher purpose. And the higher purpose is more impact for society. And uh, we have been very much inward looking, like the previous slides have been showing, and we want to have a more, a more relationship with, with society. And we want to reward people for, for looking and spending time on that relationship. Because we sincerely believe, and it has been shown by sociologists and historical research, that that improves the impact of science. And uh, getting out of the ivory tower, really going in, into the uh, in, into society. And this is also what has been shown uh, um, behind my head here, which is to be found on the Utrecht University Open Science website. Uh, highly recommend. Uh, so that's very important. And this keeps. The second thing to say is yes, there is research for research, uh, and this is more basic. And there is applied research. There is these. There is now a strong hierarchy that applied is of, is sort of low church compared to basic. Uh, so social science and humanities are losing from the STEM. I'm a chemist on background, so I did a wonderful job always in this type of uh, evaluations. Uh, we always won. Uh, we're winning from the the social science and, and humanities. So this is of course ironically what I say. These hierarchies are say false, and uh, we have the the research and evaluation system should really cater to. Uh, to 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 get over of these uh, hierarchies, and uh, Ludwig and other people have been say mentioning that as well. And and don't underestimate these hierarchies; they are killing. Also, the, between say the, the north and the global south, that's the same type of actions are, are and same kinds of games are being played. So it's really. And the other thing is the third thing I want to say is this is very important also for changing your evaluation system. It is very important to keep in mind what is the strategy of your unit, your department, your university. What do you want? What is your aim? What do you want to achieve with your research? Is it only getting papers and more more funding, which was of course Utrecht University 2008, uh, and we are still a little bit ashamed about that. We want to have we wanted to have more ER, ERC grants, for instance. To do what? So very important is what's your mission? What's your strategy? What do you want to deliver to society? And you need basic science, you need social, social science and humanity, you need all the disciplines now to, to get around these really awkward problems. Look what happens now in Europe, uh, not even mentioning what happens in Ukraine. So we need everybody to understand why the COVID uh, pandemic was so poorly handled, etc. And I'm an infectious disease person on background, to be sure. Um, so this is, I think this cannot be stressed enough, enough, enough. It's all about strategy. Look, I, I published a book and there's a, a, an item in it. If it's called, it's all about strategy. And this is for, this is also for younger careers, but also of course, for the more responsible professorships, et cetera, et cetera. If you hire a professor in Poitiers, you have to ask this person, did you see that we have made choices for teams? Can you, what can, how can you add to my team, to our team, the, to our thematic research? This is very important. And even for postdocs, people, young people, are more engaged than we than than say the, the people that started in university 20 years ago. Of course, I I'm an old guy from the 60s, so uh, I'm very much engaged. So in in this triple, uh, I see you smiling, Ludwig. And um, um, in this triple, uh, say we, we we started to do this in 2016 in in the medical center. I was the dean, and uh, and we 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 had thematic profiles. We wanted to we had made concrete choices to. With, with what what our research should be looking at and, and catering to, and so we started to change that uh, that system. And it can be found in my book. It's all open access, free to download. Uh, and there was an exercise. The exercise is: if you change the research and evaluation system, you're changing the reputation, the funding allocation. You're changing basically the whole idea of what is science. What is science about? Science about about. And what is science? Who, 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 who science is it? And for whom do we do the science? And are we, are we in, in say in connection with these people that we, we that we are think we are going to cater to, etc. And this is at, at the same time it's about reputation and of course allocations of not only rep, rep, but also say professorships also in Poitiers, 
professorships, um, permanent positions, uh, funding, uh, allocation of funding by funders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So don't make a mistake. Research, changing the research evaluation system, changing the evaluation system of academics in university, for instance, researchers versus education. That is a power game. You are really changing the power game. And the French, uh, in this uh, session, they know their Bourdieu and 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 Latour. And th these people have been pointing out that this is a power game, a social game with social capital, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Don't underestimate that. Ac academics don't like to talk about politics. They say to they said to me, "No, Frank, it's not about politics. It's about quality." Yeah, huh. yeah? of course, this is a political game. You you know this, eh? And, and so we have to keep this in mind and we have to be very honest about it. So my talks, you can go to the internet and find them. I always start, even in Singapore and Hong Kong, I say, my first name is Frank. So let's be frank about science. Let's speak, speak about these issues that are, of course, horrible to talk about because it's about money. It's about the dirty uh, sides of, of getting a professorship. I, I, I became a professor, of course. And so we have to deal with these issues because most of the resistance is coming from the people who are losing. And that's completely understandable, but we have to put this on the table. We have to be frank about this because, and we have to accommodate them. We have to say, no, it's not against basic science, but we also need other science, which is also excellence. That is the, the speech that I have been doing. You see already, I, I, I'm already talking from my experience in changing the system in the university, in my medical center, because even in the medical center, there are strong hierarchies. It, there's a strong hierarchy for molecular, uh, fMRI, uh, high tech, that's of course high church. And if you want to say, uh, think about mobility uh, rehabilitation sciences, um, ge real geriatrics or pediatrics, that's low church. And don't underestimate, underestimate these effects on, say, choices to be made. And this is really something that people don't like too much, but we have to really discuss this also in Europe. And of course, pluriformity. So if that is, we have to acknowledge that social science and humanities has excellence in itself and cannot be compared with, say, chemistry or physics or whatever. Don't even think about comparisons. It's irrelevant. So research evaluations are extremely context dependent, extremely. And so we have to acknowledge that all of the time. I'm, I'm nearly done. This is my computer. And uh, so the other thing is, and it's also about EDI, equality, diversity and inclusiveness. Why? Of course, also for HRM, but also because if you study problems like we did in Ethiopia or South Africa, you have to understand what's going on in these, in these countries. How, what is the culture, the anthropology of, the, of, of those countries? And as a chemist, you don't have an idea. You don't have a clue. So we, ha we have to have people that are, say, uh, coming from totally different disciplines to help us to really solve these problems and to have to come and produce robust, significant knowledge. You cannot, this is, this is also a reason why we have to have EDI. If you study, uh, say specific, say prevention, preventive health issues in England, in the mid, in, in the Midlands, we have to realize that about 40% has a BAME background. People in England know what that means. And so, and we have to take that into account also for students, for PhDs, and also for our staff. So our staff should in that reflect our problem. I'm done. I think um, this is really, really a very important. So um, keep in mind, it's Europe, but it's also UNESCO. It's a very international in Latin America. People have been doing this also, even before we were starting to do this. We, let's be honest. It, and we have to take Africa and also the, the, the Southeast Asia into account. Say, uh, I, I've been discussing with people from Indonesia and they, they point out what, where their problems and their sorrows are. And we have to take that into account. So we have to be really inclusive in that respect also internationally. And I think UNESCO is doing a good job. A lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is to be found on the internet. You can easily Google me, Frank Minima, and then you find it. And, uh, and of course, I'm always reading my mail uh, day and night. And so you can always mail me to discuss. And I thank you, Doris, for this, um, for the invitation and to be part of this uh, excellent, say, uh, symposium. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm conscious we are running over time. Um, I'm going to ask one question, though, before we take a break uh, uh, for lunch, and that is uh, some of the things we've heard uh, throughout the presentations this morning show the um, the need for connectivity, connectivity in terms of research assessment as part of career assessment and also connectivity across. Um, if you look at the, the European research area, um, 
action areas, strategic agenda, the priority actions, that there is great connectivity across those. But each of those has its own political fiche that is developing for that action area. So how can we ensure that the connectivity you spoke there in terms of equality, diversity, inclusion, um, how can we ensure that as we move forward to have a reform of the research assessment system, that it does actually reflect the necessary connectivity, that we don't have separateness. And then when we try to put everything together, it actually doesn't work. So uh, maybe each of you could just uh, very, very briefly just answer that. And then, as I say, I'm sure there's some hungry people wanting to have their lunch. Ludovic. Ludovic, can you? Oh, uh, can somebody un allow uh, Ludovic to be presenter so he can unmute? Frank, do you want to uh, maybe yeah, while we I go first? I think I think that we have to acknowledge that there that the the performity so that there is there are totally different contexts where those people that are have to be connected are working in. Uh, I think that is that is something that has been say uh, over and over been expressed already. So we are we realize that these we have to keep that in mind when we do research evaluation. So it should be it should be say um, uh, catering to these needs of of, of these different say uh, 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 member states and also cities and regions etc. I think the, uh, what my experience has been in Utrecht that changing the system to more qualitative context dependent evaluations is is not a threat. I say because people really understand it. Even people from the uh, United States came to us and say, well, we understand what you do and we see what quality is. So it's not that you we lose the idea of quality, not at all. In peer review, quality is also there and, and the eye is on, the, on excellence. Although not in using one hoop, but using different hoops, but those different hoops can be, can be say, uh, explained. Everything is explainable in that sense. And then you can connect. Uh, Ludovic, I think you now have the possibility to say something. Yes, yes, sorry, indeed. Um, yeah, actually, I think it all comes back to the synergy between education and research, actually. Because uh, we, we uh, just a very simple example. Uh, we all know that researchers may have or wish to have also some education activities. It just starts with, for instance, the training of their uh, uh, young uh, doctoral uh, fellows. And, and uh, if indeed the, the, the major European programs, Erasmus on one side, uh, Horizon Europe now, are, are not strongly connected, how can the individual activities and actions be also connected? So we always come back to this issue, how can we have synergy between all the missions? Thank you. And Tulio, I, I think very much from your presentation, and of course, as European University Alliances, we are addressing all of the missions, but would you like to to make a comment in, in relation to the, the, the question? I, I do very happily. Um, the comment I have is when I, when I, as a person, I'm not speaking now as an institution, it's very difficult for me to speak with, let, let alone seven, but when I'm thinking of uh, what is the set of dimensions in which we operate as researchers, I picture it as a sphere. It's fully connected, but it is made of very three different pie elements, you know, sections of this, of this sphere. One is doing research, the other is educating, and the other is outreaching, reaching out to, to the society in which we live. All these things, I see them permeate one another, and it, and it is so obvious to see it, but it is also so distant from the way we, in some way, are pushed into working. So if you want, to make a career concentrate on one you know this is the contradiction in terms that we often see thank you and i think uh, actually i i have great faith that that uh, frank and ludovic will uh, support this connected agenda as part of your work uh, with the european commission and i i know that many of the european university alliances are going to be part of the coalition of the willing so we'll be reinforcing um that as well so uh, on that note i i'd like to thank all of the panel and I, i'm sorry that anouk couldn't stay with us i hope she has made her train 
Um, and I'd like to now break for lunch. And I think so we've actually reduced your lunch to 45 minutes. Well, actually 40 minutes at this stage, probably uh, apologies for that. But I hope you have stayed with us um, and I look forward to the afternoon uh, sessions, uh, the different uh, clusters that you can join. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Doris. Uh, before the lunch break, I have some information regarding the afternoon session. So they will be start at one thirty, and uh, they will talk about the clusters uh, on common science agenda, business and society and academic cooperation, public engagement and cross-cutting principles to address transformative research and innovation agenda. Um, there was a problem in the program, the online program was corrected, so let me turn your attention that uh, the open science cluster will start at 3.30 in the afternoon. So thank you very much for your uh, presence. Uh, we meet you back at 1.30.